Everyone, 大家早上好 My name is Kang Ni, and you know I'm very glad to be here today. And first of all, we'd like to thank、uh, Ashupur CI for giving us this opportunity to participate in this webinar. First of all, let me just do a very quick intro about SPTEL.、Uh, SPTEL has been around for 23 years, and we started off as part of SP Group under the name of SP Telecom as a network infrastructure provider, where we own, build. And power communications and infrastructure services in Singapore. Our main business was to build and lay the fiber network, and we provided this service mainly for SP Group to ensure connectivity between substations and buildings, so that we can monitor the power network. Right in 2015, we started to introduce our fiber services to enterprises, and in 2017, a joint venture between ST Engineering Electronics and SP Group was done. Leveraging on the assets of our parents, namely the existing network of fiber optic backhaul infrastructure and facilities, plus the ICT expertise of SD Electronics, we are able to strengthen our position in the smart city market. And SBTEL has stepped up to the plate as Singapore's only alternate network service provider and second backbone for Singapore with our unique fiber pathways that do not follow typical telco routes. And in 2018, we launched our IoT as a service、um, platform. In 2019, we rebranded as SPTEL, and we are proud also to win an award for our IoT as a service platform under the SBR Technology Excellence Awards. In 2020 and beyond, how do we accelerate your digitalization journey, right? And how do we prepare SMEs and, and enterprise for the digital future? How can we enable your business transformation journey? Our topic for today is preparing for the digital future through business transformation. So there are two key concepts here: digital future and business transformation. Indeed, digital solutions has become more deeply embedded in our lives, from telecommuting, online food and services, and virtual、mm-hmm. events like what we are doing now have all become the norm. It has changed the way businesses are being conducted, and as reflected in Minister Singh's 42 budget pack,、uh, speech. A McKinsey study shows that we have seen the equivalent of five years of consumer and business digital adoption in just eight weeks since the COVID-19 pandemic started. Indeed, COVID-19 has done what many business owners found hard to do, and that is to accelerate digitalization. SMEs are the key driving force for Singapore's economy. It is therefore critical for everyone here to understand the importance of digitalizing and scaling up to become more competitive. In the marketplace, and business transformation is done through digitalization, which is an ongoing journey and covers vast applications, from automating your operations、uh, process to investing in robust new technologies such as IoT, AI, machine learning, and robotics process automation. The benefits range from raising customer service to managing costs, keeping pace with competition, and building ecosystem connectivity. Transformation is therefore an immense, continuous undertaking, and effective digitalization requires SMEs to depart from traditional operating models and le-、uh, legacy architectures, and demands a longer view on resource investments. This calls for organizations to leverage new tools and applications, digital talents, and new ways of working, and ecosystem connectivity to deliver enhanced products and services, and pursue new markets and customers. And with the risks intensifying alongside digital adoption, they also need to consider new dimensions of security challenges such as cyber threats and vulnerabilities. And as digitalization becomes the competitive game changer, how can SMEs leverage an emerging technology such as IoT and a robust network to future-proof themselves for the new economy? How can they more effectively reboot their business for the digital future, and at the same time? Ensure that the network and endpoints are being protected against cyber attacks. We shall now discuss more in detail. So, from here, the COVID nineteen pandemic has actually accelerated many changes in our economy and society. And to thrive in this uncertain and challenging economy, businesses must be agile and constantly adapt to new operational challenges and the fast changing requirements of your customers who are looking for new ways of transacting with businesses. Therefore, the need for adoption of digital solutions is no longer a luxury, but a necessity to ensure business resilience and to open up new business opportunities. First of all, let's take a look at the digital adoption trends in Singapore. 
According to a 2019 study by MTI, basic digital tools are widely adopted by firms in Singapore. However, adoption rates for digital platform tools and advanced digital tools such as IoT, digital analytics and AI are considerably lower, especially amongst SMEs. This suggests that there is room for SMEs to scale up in their digitalization efforts by using more advanced digital technologies. An MTI study also found that the adoption of digital tools leads to an increase in a firm's value add and productivity by an average of 25% and 16% respectively. Embracing digitalization and transformation will therefore help SMEs ensure continued profitability in this uncertain and challenging economy. So how can SMEs start the transformation journey on the right foot? Resilient connectivity is a must. The more dependent your business becomes on online solutions, cloud collaborations and connected devices. With our unique fiber infrastructure set up along the power network, we provide connectivity that is truly diverse uh, compared to other telcos as our network core is physically separate from the shared infrastructure. Our fiber also passes through our own buildings for greater physical security from tampering. This means that we are able to provide you the network resilience that you need for your business to transform, especially when you are looking to embracing emerging innovative technologies. Take for example, one of our partners, uh, uh, one of our customers, New and Partners Global, MPG. Right, so the trading, trading atrium by Neo and Partners Global MPG is designed to be technologically sophisticated uh, financial trading facility that covers all aspects of a trading ecosystem. It was created to help high growth, medium sized international financial firms to jumpstart their digital automation journey. The trading atrium's key differentiator and unique competitive advantage lies in that its powerful capability to conduct multi asset global trading on one single broker neutral platform. This platform can also be assessed securely either on premise at the trading atrium or off premise to facilitate working from home or team segregation measures. To deliver a high performance platform to their customers, an ultra low latency network is needed to support responsiveness. For the platform to function reliably, MPG sought to partner SPTEL to provide highly resilient connectivity with inbuilt redundancy. So SPTEL was able to fulfill MPG's requirements for a diversified network because we are the only network service provider to use unique fiber pathways that combine this SP group infrastructure and own fiber pipes laid, laid alongside the power network cables. And at SPTEL, we believe in delivering high quality fiber connectivity for our partners by owning, managing and maintaining our own fiber network. We are also able to ensure that the network is built to our exacting standards. And we have built our network with highly protected fiber routes and core density at every stage, plus dual exchanges for buildings with SPTEL resource as a standard. This means that should there be any disruption with one of our exchange, traffic will be rerouted via the next exchange route with minimal impact um, to operations. Right. So with these core competencies, SPTEL ensures uh, MPG's mission critical data is delivered one way or another. Other than a robust network infrastructure, we have also equipped our network with intelligence capabilities. The new software-defined network with network functions virtualization will enable users to have holistic network management that provides greater control, visibility, and scalability for their network. Great. So as part of um, uh, delivering business-grade services to customers, um, Ting Ting, maybe you can move to the next slide. Um, right, uh, uh, the next slide. Right, thanks. So as part of delivering business uh, great services to customers, SPTEL's customer portal improves business agility with instant quotations and network diagrams via a front-end customer portal. But once a service is confirmed, a resource check, scheduling of appointments, appointments and triggering of field engineers to help with the customer setup are all fired through automatically to minimize time wasted on manual processes. Once we have established a connection for customers, any additional deployment of services can be conducted in minutes and fired through digitally through our network with real time status updates. These efficient procedures will enable users to bring their solutions to market faster. 
And to deliver greater reliability and uptime, we use AI to detect network disruptions and automatically reroute traffic via the next available path for uninterrupted, un uninterrupted connectivity. And our clean pipe network also comes with DDoS attack detection, uh, attack detection as a default to enable customers to proactively mitigate and fend off cyber threats. Additional cybersecurity requirements can also be provisioned on the fly and deployed via the cloud for faster turnaround for your defenses. The key benefit of our versatile um, solution structure is that it enables companies to cater for network fluctuations for consistent optimum performance, whatever your traffic situation may be. And with a scalable bandwidth on demand, companies pay for only what they need and when they need it. This is especially critical in situations such as a pandemic, whereby business networks may need to scale on demand to cater for an increase in web conferencing, online collaboration and digitalization efforts. SBTEL Solution thus acts as a smart business supporter, a digitization accelerator, an operations optimizer and an innovation enabler, boosting configurable features such as network service on demand, a secure clean pipe, and a management dashboard for a real-time network monitoring and decision making. All right, um, next slide. So with SPTEL's um, software-defined network with network functions virtualization, organizations are freed from um, rigid legacy systems so that they can better support their smart nation use case with agile, secure, and resilient connectivity. To bring push to us to bring to push the envelope even further, we have also converted our pervasive hubs around the island that are linked with our SDN with into edge computing locations. This will enable faster and high performance support for IoT and 5G deployment across our network. So SPTEL's uh, multi-access edge computing platform is basically an edge platform as a service that provides container-based computing resource at the edge for test-based applications. So SPTEL's MEC platform is a key component to support digitalization, especially to host diverse smart city technologies, such as drone deployments, driverless car navigation, video analytics, which are bandwidth and compute intensive, and require a low latency turnaround time with fast computing um, capabilities. Our pervasive hubs around the island enable the deployment of customers' IoT applications on the MEC around the edge locations closer to the data source and point of consumption with efficient computing capabilities. Some use case examples uh, with edge computing capabilities, uh, drones will be able to automate um, data management and stream the data directly to the cloud for processing and analytics. Edge computing makes it possible for data upload to take place closer to drones operation locations. And with 5G, drone inspections at the edge will become the norm, unlocking true automation, generating instant insights, and allowing for automated tasking based upon independent systems and sensors. The amount of data that increased substantially with 5G, therefore making it necessary to process at the edge. And this has major implications for drone delivery and inspection, uh, meaning enterprises will be able to deploy more drones uh, to execute complex use cases, which generate and consume vast amounts of data and edge connectivity. Right. So with this in mind, our award-winning IoT as a service platform was also developed to allow IoT service providers to tap on our truly diverse fiber network and pervasive hubs to accelerate IoT implementation and improve device performance. So some of us are perhaps you strangers to the acronym IoT, even though we may already have experienced the start of the on ongoing IoT revolution. IoT is at work when we use a Fitbit to record and transmit data when we exercise and sleep. And IoT powers smart appliances present in homes today, where we can control them remotely via a smartphone app. For SMEs who have not tapped into IoT as part of your digitalization, it is useful to know the following advantages, such as predictive maintenance to help you reduce unnecessary costs, and effective utilization of energy, manpower planning, and also for pandemic deployment where human intervention needs to be minimized. Right. However, in our conversations with IoT solution providers, we see the following challenges. For example, various IoT connectivity standards with no interoperable features, high deployment and infrastructure costs, multiple parties to work with, and also cross-system integration and interoperability. 
So your IoT journey with SBTEL, we provide you the speed, basically the um, integrated solution for quick deployment and robust connectivity. All right, uh, and you, we help you to remove the hassle of dealing with multiple parties. And we also help you to host applications and device management on one open platform. Right, next. And all the data uh, is actually hosted in Singapore. And to further improve IoT device performance and reduce your investment in bandwidth for data transmission, you can tap onto our pervasive edge hubs to do computing and analysis that's closer to the industries, events, and the people that you serve. And by ensuring that your data can be analyzed closer to its source, you benefit from lower latency for improved device performance and lower cost for data transmission. And you also be able to work with a wide range of protocol options. Um, such as LoRa and Wi-Fi, right? Um, and of course, uh, our platform provides you a subscription-based model and is supported by a flexible network that allows on-demand provisioning of additional bandwidth and services. And for IoT solution providers who wish to leverage on SBTEL's IoT as a service platform, there is an IoT as a service POC program that we offer and is supported and funded by ESG. They consist of a free trial period of up to six weeks and 50% subsidy on pilot fees for up to three months. So for, for SMEs looking at embarking on IoT journey, you can link us up with your IoT solution providers and together we can embark on this program. And today we are actually proud to announce some key partners uh, who are already on board with us to enable smart facilities um, solutions. It includes smart washrooms, smart bins, rodent monitoring, space management solutions, COVID-19 related solutions, lift monitoring solutions, as well as video surveillance. So SMEs need to hunt as a pack in this digitalization age. Embracing a collaborative model and the concept of a shared economy is critical. We fully understand this, and this is why we take pride to build an IoT ecosystem of partners consisting of government agencies, SME trade associations, IoT solution providers, to drive partnerships together and enabling the IoT solutions to be deployed on our platform. With rapid digitalization, we are entering an age where sharing is starting to make more economic sense than owning. Enter the world of shared economy, which is disrupting traditional business sectors. The lack of overhead and inventory help share business um, run lean. The increased efficiencies allow businesses to pass through value to their customers and supply chain partners. And IoT is driving the next step forward in the sharing economy. And businesses that unlock the potential will create and define new markets. Procuring, managing, and maintaining all assets required for digitalization and automation requires increasing funds and manpower. And this is especially prohibitive for testing out new use cases, multi-site deployments, and agility to scale and add on more functions quickly. Thus, instead of building your own IoT platform, you can leverage on a ready solution that is built to pair with devices regardless of the protocol or gateway requirements. For high performance applications requiring ultra low latency, an on-premise solution would typically be necessary. With edge computing, you benefit from uh, as a service compute resource platform that is nearer to your applications for improved latency versus public cloud without the hassle of managing equipment. And if more sites are needed, simply tap on the next nearest edge location. Ultimately, the benefit of a shared mode of operation is about changing CAPEX to OPEX for faster go to market and agility to scale. This will especially benefit SMEs who may not have the deep pockets and manpower required to fully own and manage such solutions, freeing up budget and resources on the key strengths. So before we end, I would like to share a couple of transformation stories. So as you see on the screen, um, we have Lift Hub Engineering Private Limited, which is actually one of our key partners for IoT. So in the past, this company actually carried out audits for an elevator or lifts manually at site to determine the equipment's condition and collecting data for door cycles, um, leveling and acceleration, and using an elevator um, analytics product via a laptop, as you can see from the picture. However, they have started to look into LoRaWAN technology and through IoT technology application to be used in elevators, they hope to improve cost savings in human resource, manpower, um, performance, operations, 
uh, monitoring and predictive maintenance. And with the help of remote diagnostics, real-time notifications and predictive behavioural insights, they will be able to share the data with related stakeholders and a sustainable business in place towards their digital transformation approach. And it's all enabled on SPTAL's IoT as a service platform. And just a few days ago, um, the next slide please. Just a few days ago, uh, news of a, a nine style coffee machine named the Copymatic hit the papers. So this machine is actually a brainchild of Mr. Jason, uh, if you can see from the picture, who came up with the idea that he could not find you know, a, a skilled coffee brewer after opening his, his shop in One North. And discovering this gap in the market, he decided to take matters in his own hands and take on the challenge of making the first version of the machine. And he also learned 3D printing with computer-aided um, design and manufacturing to create the prototypes. And today, I think they have already rolled out, uh, hope to roll out about 1,000 units by 2022 and receive the interest from at least 10 local uh, coffee shop chains. All right. And the next one, uh, with support of ESG, um, company LinkJack developed an IoT platform last year to enable real-time checks on fire safety equipment in buildings. The platform, also known as FireNote, consists of a dashboard and a wireless monitoring system with sensors that can be attached to fire extinguishers. The sensors track information such as the pressure level in an extinguisher and detect obstacles that may block people's access to fire safety apparatus. This data can then be accessed wirelessly via the system's dashboard, enabling owners or occupants of buildings to identify faults or maintenance issues quickly. And this has actually reduced the time spent on manual fire safety checks by more than 90% and provided real-time fire extinguished status, updates um, seamlessly without human intervention and replaced the monthly inspection work and therefore increased the company's productivity. And lastly, Fong's Engineering and Manufacturing recently also made the headlines for being the first Singapore SME to launch a fully automated production line. They started out as a manufacturer of metal components, supplying individual parts um, to sectors such as electronics, defense, and oil and gas in, in the 1980s. And in less than 40 years, the company has transformed itself into a product owner and now specializes as a manufacturer of high-end medical devices, such as endoscopy and surgical power tools. So these are the kind of uh, you know, inspiring um, transformation stories that we hear, all right? And with that, you know, I would like to end off with some key takeaways uh, to enable SMEs in your digitalization journey. So SPTEL is basically a business class digital service provider with unique fiber pathways to ensure reliability and resiliency for your connectivity. Coupled with our digitalized service experience that enables quotations, services on demand, automated order through flow through and transparency for network utility and spends, we can meet changing needs and support your digitalization efforts. And with the push towards IoT and the build up of a smart nation, our award winning IoT platform as a service that acts as a one stop solution for IoT deployment, as well as our distributed edge computing hubs around the island, we hope to enable faster go to market for IoT with greater cost effectiveness by leveraging a ready, shareable platform for deployment and computing. All right, so with this, I thank you for your time and I shall hand it over to Valerie who will share with you how she has transformed her business. All right, over to you, Chris and Valerie. Uh, thank you, Kang Lee, for the presentation. Uh, we will now go into a short poll first. Uh, so you can see the, the question on the screen. So we'd like to pose a question uh, on what do you think is most important for speeding up your IoT deployment? So at this juncture, uh, we'll just let Valerie prepare her slides first uh, while she get ready to, uh, to, to come on. So we'll probably just take another uh, 30 seconds just for everyone just to participate in, uh, in a short poll. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, Valerie, over to you. Hey, good morning, everyone. I am Valerie from MarkX. So I've spent the past 10 years running my business in corporate apparel, tech development in IoT application, as well as digital consultancy and training. Today, I'm privileged to be invited by SPTEL to share my personal experience in digitalizing business operations and how it has created the edge I needed to keep my business competitive and sustainable. A little about MarkX. So we established the business six years ago to focus on the development of IoT application to address industrial pain points. 
and today we are the leading IoT solution provider in Singapore. So during this pandemic period, we actually developed a cost-effective smart temperature screening solution that fully integrates with safe entry portal in order to help SME resume operation in their workplace. So uh, across the years, we have also developed and uh, implemented LT solution in cargo management system, in street lighting, as well as elder care uh, management system. Today, I'm happy to share with you one of my success stories, Digital Transformation for Butterfly Design a corporate apparel company. So Butterfly Tissers is established in 2011 and we specialize in customized or corporate apparel, uniform inventory management for banks, and recently intelligent uniform. So we are the first in the industry to adopt a 3D body scanner for our business. Perceived as a disruptor of the industry, it derives a competitive edge to survive the price war dominated by well-established and better resource players. So today we are operating competitively with Lean, uh, Headcount, streamlined by digitalization. Just to give you a sense of our geographical footprint, we have factories in Singapore and four other countries in Asia, including China and Malaysia. So we have our customers from international companies, public listed companies, MSC and SMB. So like all businesses, we do have um, struggles, especially so for traditional businesses. And at Butterfly Business, we have um, faced challenges in high reliance on state workforce, highly competitive market space, as well as inefficient business uh, model. So because of that, we have um, issues of these challenges in uh, meeting the bottom line, and then we know that it's a need for change. So with our limited resources, we managed to find a few um, focus areas to work on in terms of digitalization. Let's look at the first focus area. We did a digitalization of our pattern draft. So pattern drafting is, uh, in our industry, a very manual and time-consuming process. So when customer actually replace, um, repeat order with us, our draft lot got lost and then got mixed up. And, and then we have to resort to borrow samples from our client. And this clearly has eroded our customers' confidence in us, and therefore we find the need to change. As we lead the digitalization for the computer aided drafting, we manage to optimize our land for the, our layout and manage to have a good management system. And this has actually um, enhanced our work efficiency and allow flexibility for our outsourcing work. With that, we are able to restore our customers' confidence and reduce our operating costs within a few months. The next area of focus is actually on the dissemination of our ERP system, which we developed in-house. And from this um, digitalization, we managed to replace the manual and time-consuming um, procedure because this will assist us to generate quotation, generate invoice, issue work order, and then generating the uh, delivery order. So this is what happens and what is uh, being shown at the back end of our dashboard, where we are able to communicate with our sub point and then to be able to uh, make important decisions based on this. And the outcome of our implementation is um, it allows us to integrate 700 item masters and it allows us to monitor all the processes and organize our resources. With that, we are able to maximize our operational effectiveness. And having done that, we managed to restore one hit count and improve our work order accuracy. Let's take a look at the third area of focus, which is the introduction of 3D for the scanner. Uh, this is actually a breakthrough technology that we got in from America. It is fast and it takes only 35 seconds of our time to take the body measurement. Because of this, we are able to give them a novel customer experience and we created new opportunities. And during this COVID um, pandemic period, we are still able to serve our customers because it is a contactless process where we can ensure safe distancing. So the digital 
Digestion outcome allows us to ensure that the data are being stored, organized, and archived for future reference. With that, we are able to enhance our customer experience and most importantly, reduce reliance on our state costs. The use of our 3D body scanner has been featured in the new channel coverage um, by the Essential Millennium 2020 to showcase the future of retail experience. Next is the launch of our e-commerce platform. We launched our um, uniformonline.com.sg, which is a customized platform that allows single-piece customization. With that, we are able to ride on the wave of the e-commerce um, wave, and we are able to boost our profile in the virtual space. So platform for um, digital marketing has been set up because of this digital digitalization, and we are able to internationalize quickly without the need to set up um, physical offices overseas. So we capitalize on omni-channel platform, which allow us to orchestrate our digital marketing activities. And with this, we are able to build a stronger presence in the market. We tap on data analytics and Google Analytics in order to gain insights of our customers and their preference, and therefore able to build our resources um, where areas where we can actually get a higher return on investment. And the last area of focus is the recent introduction of intelligent uniform. So this is a technology which um, with use of RFID, which is being embedded in apparels. It is washable, cost effective and easy to manage. With that, we are able to add value to the use of the uniform where the uniform can be a device to allow us to enhance operational efficiency and aid safety monitoring. Our intelligent uniform is fully compatible with Escatel Lorong Gateway, and this can be adopted across construction environment uh, in Singapore. So like all digital transformation, it is not without any challenges. Today, I would like to share with you what are the challenges that has been uh, Faced by us during the journey. For internal stakeholders, change management is a delicate one. We need to be patient with teething issues, and we must understand as business owners that not everybody is very excited about the changes. Hence, we need to understand what is the resistance to change of our employee, as well as why are they um, fearful about losing their jobs and the potential steep learning curve that they may face. We face resistance with our partners as well in the ecosystem, such as our um, uh, customers, ranging from supplier to support our willingness to adapt. And therefore, we have to expose them to initiatives repeatedly. So like all business owners, we hope that our digitalization will be able to happen overnight. However, many of times we are very limited by the resources that we have on hand. And we can tap on grants, um, Although you can tap on first and there's initial um, investment outlay that we have to come up with, many of times we have to balance short-term interest versus our long-term gain. While technology is widely available, however, the best is often beyond us because of our the, of the limited budget. Hence, we have to purchase things that we need and we have to pay special attention to the robustness and versatility of the product that we use. Digitalization has also increased our susceptibility to cyber attacks. For this part, I will leave it to our next speaker, Jonas, to continue and focus on that. So then, how can we future-proof our business in this uh, recent climate and um, going forward? So from a top-down approach, leaders must set the tone. And we need to lead as an example and uh, allocate budget according to the cost. At the same time, we have to identify what are the potential areas that can transform our business with digitalization. For example, how do we leverage IoT to collect massive data for analysis? Third, we have to have a strong core team. We need to rope in experts so that they can share our experience and their experience and then contribute to smoothen our transformation journey. Fourth, Having right partners is important. 
uh, for example, SPTEL, strategic tech co-developer or go-to market partner. And we need to embrace change. As business owners, we need to constantly evolve as the business landscape changes to remain relevant and also profitable. Otherwise, we will be out of, we will lose out to the market. And continue to invest in technology as much as you can. So at this point of time, I would like to also share with you a recent collaboration with SPTEL. So during this pandemic period, MarkX actually came out and developed a sex device, which is accurate, affordable, and a contactless way of measuring temperature. It is quick to deploy and easy, easily accessible through our mobile devices and fully integrated with safe entry portal. So through the uh, collaboration with SPTEL, we are able to tap on their central management platform system to network and then manage geographically distributed sets from a single location. And this collaboration actually affect, allow MarkX to add value to our sets user and it, also, it will not dilute our effort in producing better solutions to meet the industrial pain points. So for various reasons, many businesses today have faced a dip in the revenue. And it has also clearly shown that digitalization has proven to reverse the trend. In my closing, I would like to leave with you three takeaways. First, digitalization is, is, not, is for everybody. And if you are ready to embrace, you will be able to transform. Secondly, the future is not all doom and gloom. And this is the time, the best time to change. While the effect of digitalization may not be immediate, it will definitely come true as the benefit of digitalization will slowly but surely. With that, I end my session and I'll pass the time to donors. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful sharing. I think uh, you're really one of the techno, uh, technopreneur that we have uh, showcasing here. You've actually transformed a traditional business and actually diversified into your own uh, IT firm. So uh, before that, I think we have a poll uh, from Valerie's side. So probably just let's call the poll first. So I think, uh, I, I hope that the, the sharing actually got everyone thinking. So probably it will be good if you can really take the opportunity to participate in this poll. Which stage of digital transformation are you currently at? So it's a, it's a good time uh, with uh, Valerie, sorry, just, just to actually do a self-check on your site. So uh, at this juncture, I would like to also uh, invite uh, Jonas in just to prepare himself first. Yeah, okay, I think we're good. Let's do the second poll. Yeah, okay. So for this poll, uh, we are actually asking you to probably just share with us a bit which stage of cybersecurity ad adoption are you at at the moment? Okay, I think we're good. Uh, Jonas, over to you. Thanks a lot, Chris, and welcome everyone to this webinar where I will give a little bit more insight about the dangerous stuff and about the hacking and the darknet and just about the threats which are out there in the internet. Myself, my name is Jonas. I'm originally from Switzerland, but relocated to Singapore last year in November. And I have the time of my life here. So I really appreciate uh, being here. I mostly focus on hacking, cybercrime. I do some ethical hacking in my free time as well. So I'm very interested in uh, understanding how do attackers operate so we are capable of putting defenses in place as well. Besides hacking and cybercrime, there's a lot about threat intelligence, understanding how the intelligence can make a difference in the end when it comes to prevention of cyber attacks. And obviously with machine learning, we already Heard it a lot today, it, it has such a big impact as it is a growing technology. So it's key to understand why this helps. To kick things off, I would like to envision all of you to think about you work in this company who invests heavily into R&D and research for um, cutting edge technologies. And imagine now you are the one who is responsible for protecting this kind of information from anyone outside your company and especially from your competitors since if someone gets access to your competitive knowledge, you might have some issues in the market out there. So this is really one of your main concerns. Secure your data. And in the past, unfortunately, you heard quite a lot that there are a lot of cyber attacks out there against a lot of different companies and you decide to invest 
and consult with a third party company to get a little bit more idea what's going on in your network, try to figure out, hey, um, is, am I secure? Because in my opinion, everything works fine, but just to be double, just, just to be sure, let's, let's do a, an additional test. But unfortunately, very quickly after you engage that consulting company, you get the bad news and they tell you, hey, someone is in your network. And the consulting company spends days and nights and to gather as much information as possible to, to find out, hey, we find all those kind of artifacts and hints that someone is in your network, but nothing is getting blocked, email is still working, backup files are not encrypted. So you don't really understand what is going on. So the guys spend a lot of more time to figure out, hey, what's going on? And sooner than later, they give you the bad news. They're like, hey, fortunately, nothing is damaged, but we figured out someone is in your network and he's spying and he's listening. And this is quite an uncomfortable feeling for you since you know that someone is inside your company, which is very similar than you getting up in the morning, feeling super fresh, going to the bathroom, and you see a note on the mirror on your bathroom, and it says, hey, I've been in your house all night long. So it gives you this kind of feeling, which is very, very unpleasant. And you might ask yourself, how could this happen? Um, and and how, do we, how do we even end up at this point? And unfortunately, this is something which I see quite a lot, actually almost on a daily basis, that a lot of companies get attacked these days, but not always there's immediate damage. Often it's about spying, about gathering information. So it's important to be aware about these kinds of threats out there. Talking about the bad guys and the threats out there, it's also very important to differentiate between them because not all of the attackers are the same. For example, if you care about your IT and you have people managing this kind of IT and they're overworked or have not enough time to do certain tasks, this can lead to a lot of problems since internal user error, also known as misconfiguration of, for example, your website, your web shop, or other applications which are connected to the internet can lead to a lot of problems. And that's why it's important to keep in mind that internal user errors is something which we need to be aware of and we need to give the people who maintain our security a lot of trust and support them from the top down. So it is important that top management level is supported when it comes to security. Then we also have the opportunistic hackers, which are usually a bunch of guys who try to make a little bit of money. They're not that dangerous, but with the right tools, even they can harm you quite a bit. But then moving on the, the ladder, it gets more and more dangerous. We have inside threats which work inside a company and maybe they're not happy with their manager. They seek for revenge. Maybe they, they need more money. So they try to capital gains inside corporate networks, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always important to keep in mind, not only are there threats outside, but also inside the network. And it's important to have policies in place. So no matter where someone is, we have to follow certain rules and procedures. Hacktivists on the other side are usually not something we deal with something personally, unless it's politically and uh, social agendas involved. So those guys usually don't care that much about the money. It's more about what they think is best to do. The biggest issues for us are usually organized crime and government sponsored attack because they're, those guys are after money. Organized crime is something we deal with on a daily basis. They are very well organized and those are our main guys which we fight against and that's why it's important to understand how do they operate to put effective security layers in place. Let me give you a quick example how I approach certain tasks from, from an offensive part of view. I told you before I'm doing some ethical hacking in my free time and sometimes I try to understand how do an attacker exactly works and I would like to give you a, an example how do they operate. So for example, if an attacker has the goal to get access to a computer inside a company, how would you start? And the most important phases are shown at the bottom of this slide. So before doing anything, it's like robbing or being a burglar into a physical apartment. The first thing you do is we do observation. It doesn't make sense to attack someone immediately if we have no idea what's going on. So doing a lot of reconnaissance in the real world would be uh, checking out if someone is at home, if there's a watchdog, if there's an alarm system, is the balcony, for example, always open? Because all those things 
have a big impact on how our strategy works when it comes to attacking. And depending on their strategy, we need to have certain strategies from a defensive layer as well. So if attackers try to get access to your corporate computers, they usually get their social engineering information and use this kind of information to attack you. For example, if my goal would be to get access to a corporate computer, I would probably look out for the HR department because HR departments, they need to open PDFs because it's their goal to hire new people. So they are very well uh, aware that they get emails with PDFs with possible applications. And this is something which attackers try to abuse. They always try to be one step ahead of the curve and send you this kind of infected PDF. And once you click in this email, on this phishing email, everything goes pretty quickly. They start to execute malware, they start to encrypt your system, and they start to move granularly through your network. And it shows pretty well that the, the information which is out there helps a lot when it comes from reconnaissance and move on through your network. Some of these steps takes very long time, months, weeks, hours, and um, it's important to keep in mind that every attack has a clear idea how it works, certain steps involved, and we can use this kind of information to, to secure ourselves even better as well. And I don't want to touch all the threats which happened in the last couple of years, but the, the main one which I really want to focus on are the IoT threats, because everything gets connected with software and is connected to the internet. And unfortunately with IoT very often, security la layers are not in place, which means once they, once they are developed, it's about being cost efficient and being capable of bringing it faster to the market and security is not a top priority. And whatever is connected to the internet can be attacked and will be attacked. So if security is not in place, we need additional security layers. So that's where we are here to, to help with. And thinking about the, the general cyber attacks and risks, this is a very interesting um, report, which I recently read from the World Economic Forum, because they treat cyber attacks and the information infrastructure breakdown as top priority. Even now, during a, this, during a global pandemic with COVID-19, we see here on the left side, we have infectious diseases. They rate this lower than cyber attacks and information infrastructure breakdown. Why? Because these days, almost, everyone is online. You don't need a license or training to get to the internet. All you need is a credit card or even just some cash, buy a device and connect it to the internet. 75% of the population owns a mobile phone. This is a device which will be used to connect to the internet again. And almost every business relies heavily on IT. Even if it's not your main com uh, competitive area, if your IT is down, you're very likely to get bankrupt very soon because you cannot communicate with your customers. Maybe attackers are capable of stealing sensitive information, which leads you towards a disadvantage with your competitors or information gets stolen and sold on the, on the darknet. And it's a very bad, uh, a very bad impression on your company because um, you don't treat cybersecurity efficiently and customer data gets leaked, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to keep in mind more and more gets connected and being changed towards software devices and whatever's connected and being software will be attacked. So it's important to keep in mind, have security, in security protections in place to prevent these kinds of attacks. I would like to talk a little bit about the recent months, especially since with COVID, a lot of things changed. And again, attackers are aware about what's going on in the world. And being aware about COVID-19, people working from home, people want to know, hey, what's going on? Try to gather information from the internet. Attackers are like, okay, people will be at home. They wanna know what's going on in my area. How does the COVID-19 virus spread? So let's, let's create some phishing websites. And it's no surprise that whatever happens in the real world has a big impact on the cyber world and new threats are on the horizon or rising. And these kind of threats are important to be aware about because before we click on all the emails, run some software, click on email links, we need to keep in mind that probably not someone is just telling you via email to give you a lot of money, but the thing is also those email attacks gets more and more sophisticated. So it's not easy to spot these. 
And the most important thing, in my opinion, is the general awareness of the people. So we need to be able to talk to the people and explain them why it's important to think first before clicking on certain kinds when it comes to email. With the Internet of Things topic, we also have an issue, which I mentioned before, is that a lot of devices get connected to the Internet, but they need to be cheap and they need to be very efficient. Just a search engine out there, similar like Google, but for all these connected devices on the Internet. And I would like to give you a small example, which I just did this week to provide you some information. What's happening if you connect something to the Internet and you don't know what's actually working in the background from a technical point of view. So I had some different use cases about IoT, but I think the easiest one these days is to take a look at remote uh, desktops because everyone works from home, environments are changing, so people still need access to their devices. And reports for IoT devices work exactly the same. People are buying devices, putting it on the internet, and then don't think about it anymore. They just use it as the daily base, but don't think about the, the, about the holes which might open in their environment. So what I did is I had a look about certain RDP connections to the internet. These are devices which enable remote connections uh, from, from anywhere. So we were able to see um, what kind of de devices are directly connected to the internet, on what kind of platform they're running, what kind of versions they're running. This gives me a lot of information as well to understand. Is something old? Is something new? How well is it protected? And all these kind of informations are immediately available because people put it directly on the internet. And the internet is scanning and scanning and scanning and looking for new information and provides it in a database which is accessible for everyone. So this is the same with all these home devices like Amazon Echo and um, from all those different uh, uh, competitors, of course. I also was able to find out very quickly what kind of operating system is running. And again, this is something which might be highly critical because if I see something like Windows XP, which is out of date since many years, doesn't have any support anymore, I can just go to databases, look up for vulnerabilities and attack a device and immediately have access into a certain company if there's no appropriate security in place. And to make things even worse, with RDP, since you're able to connect to physical systems, this is something which I came across. I censored the IP address here on top, but it shows you that once I had access to this device, and this was all provided by this website, so looking at it is completely legal, it's for awareness, but don't go any steps further. This is very important. I'm not interacting with this device because I don't have the permission to do it, but it's important to keep in mind it is connected somewhere on the internet with bad security. And if I want to be a bad guy now, all I need to do is click here on this icon and probably with default credentials or basic usernames and passwords, I would be able to get access to these kind of um, devices. And the guys who configured that didn't have bad intention. They were just not aware about it. And that's why the awareness part is so important. You cannot just connect whatever you want to the internet without being at risk that someone is attacking it. Another very interesting story, which I would quickly give, uh, go through is there was a big travel company which was hit by a ransomware recently. And the attackers told them, hey, we infected a lot of devices. Please find proof below in the screenshots. But if you want to have your data back and you want us to delete the data from our servers, you better reach out to us quickly. So what happened? I found this chat room, which fortunately for, for us researchers was still open after the negotiation. So everyone was able to access it and read what actually kind of conversations went through. But it's in interesting to see how cyber criminal work these days, because here on the right side, we have the support guys. And the support guys, those are the cyber criminals who provide some customer support for their victims to make it easier to pay the money once they got infected. Because the cyber criminals, they want to have the money and they want to make it easier for the victims to pay the money because maybe they're not aware about technology, maybe they have no idea about the cryptocurrencies, so that they help them out. But during this whole conversation, you can see it, it works like a normal business transaction. The support guys, so here the bad guys, is telling the good guy, hey, we have 30K devices infected and locked from different countries. In our opinion, this is worth about 10 million in Bitcoins. And then the, the victim, of course, is 
you promised me a very special price if I interact quickly with you. 10 million, there's no way it's, it's a normal price. But this, the pattern is not like the victim is blaming the attacker. Why would you do that? Um, leave me alone or threatening him with law enforcement. He tries to find a solution as quick as possible to get his data back because the data is so important to him to keep his business running. And it really shows the power and the leverage of the attackers once they were capable of attacking their victims. So again, the, the support guy reminds the, the victim, hey, if you don't pay, I highly recommend paying you because it's cheaper than lawsuit, it's cheaper than reputation um, loss cost to, to leakage with the data. So uh, it goes a little bit back and forth and the, the, the victim explains, hey, I just tried to uh, keep my business afloat then, but 8 million is, is no, it's, it's not something we can pay. We, we don't make that much revenue, but what about I give you 3.7 million? So it's, it's just interesting to see how negotiations goes back and forth. And in the end, even after they made the payment, the bad guys are telling them, hey, here are some recommendations which we think you should do so it doesn't happen again. It's, it, and it's all the basic things which we always talk about. It's turn off local password, force certain administrator sessions, um, use endpoint pr uh, protection, have people in place who know what they do, uh, only run and approve certain applications which are required, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's very interesting to see that they uh, update password every month because these are the, the low hanging fruits which people are not aware about. So it's, um, it's super interesting to see from, from, a, from a bad guy's point of view that they more or less recommend exactly the same thing which we recommend as well from a defender point of view to have proper security layer in place. Long story short, in the end, um, they even thank each other, which is, uh, yeah, which is almost too, too funny to be true. But um, yeah, it's just like normal business transactions. And that's where we try to help as much as possible. I work at FortiGuard Labs, which is the research arm of Fortinet. And we care a lot about what's going on in the network. We have all those sensors around the world, which help us to understand what are the good things, what are the bad things in the internet? How do we protect these kind of threats and we use automation, we use analytics, we heard about it before, we use machine learning with all the data we gather from around the world, but not only the data from our side, also data from partners like law enforcement, like certs, like other private vendors. And we share this kind of information because all of us are aware, no one is able to solve cybercrime by itself, but together we can make a big impact. And last but not least, it's, sometimes it's always uh, when a vendor tells you we have the best security solutions in place, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Everyone would say that, but it's important for us to do third party validation. So all whatever we promise, how effective our secure, security solutions are, we, we do third party tests and all of these um, are available on, um, on these websites or on our website as well. And in the end, I think that the main differentiator which we can make is that having six million devices plus around the world will help us to understand what's going on in certain regions. For example, we have a pretty clear view what's going on in Asia Pacific and Singapore itself, what kind of threats are going on, and then act accordingly and put new intelligence security solutions in place. To finalize my slide and my part of this presentation, I just want you to be aware that the cybercrime ecosystem is growing rapidly and those guys they work like normal businesses. They have CEOs, they have account managers, they have support people, and they try to make as much money as possible. And so they go for low hanging fruits and they operate like normal businesses. And that's why in my opinion, it's quite important that you know pretty good what you're doing in your own environment when it comes to security. And if you don't, because it's not your specialty, it's important that you reach out to people who know what's going on. So that's why vendors and partners like uh, Aspital is, is, is here for you. We work very closely together with them because we share what we know. They implement these kind of security layers and it's what, what their specialty is. So they're able to help when it comes to detect, uh, detect intrusion attempts, uh, helping you with the configurations because we saw earlier if even if you have the best security solution if you make bad configuration management it doesn't help you anything if it's misconfigured so having someone who truly understands how to configure these devices effectively so security is, is proper 
um, it, it will help you a lot. And then, of course, one er once everything is in place, the monitoring part is quite important because the threat landscape shifts towards left and right. We have seen it with COVID-19. All of a sudden, everyone works from home. It has a big impact on how attackers operate, and we need to be very closely and align certain policies afterwards, of course. So with that being said, I'm very happy to hand over to the next presenter, David, who will give you a little bit more insight what you can do exactly from a product and solution point of view to secure yourself better in these kind of uh, environments. Then my name is David here. Um, I'm, the, I'm the Assistant Director Info Security from SPTEL. And um, thanks Jonas for sharing um, about what is cybersecurity attack, why attackers are motivated about attacks, right? Organized crimes, hacktivists, and things like this. So my portions and my context of presentation is about how do we protect, right? We have been working very closely with Fortinet as a partner to provide the type of threat intelligence platform, uh, uh, cybersecurity controls in place to better protect customers, right? So uh, this is my email and my LinkedIn. Um, also do like and follow uh, SPTEL LinkedIn as well. Um, we have been very active on our LinkedIn space, so watch out for that space. Okay, next, I'll talk about the recent cybersecurity news. Okay, Jonas has covered a lot on the global context, but I wanted to bring back to business owners in the context of Singapore businesses. All right, cyber attack has been on the rise. You know, if we look at uh, the very first one, which is 1.7 million per breach. You know, I extract that out from one of the news article. On the right-hand side, we talk about cyber threats in 2019 targeting Singapore businesses. Now, fast forward to year 2020, cyber attack is not going to stop, right? As long as you have an online presence and it's available 24 by 7, it's going to be out there, you know, your doors is going to be open for all the cyber threats and hackers, all right? That will try their luck, okay? So, so that's not going to stop, okay? So a quick high level overview about the cyber threats in 2019, very much is applicable in 2020 as well. Okay, Jonas talked about ransomware, what is ransomware about? Okay, so in the context of Singapore, now 35 reported cases to SingCert. So what is SingCert? It means Singapore Computer Emergency Response Team, right? which is part of the whole cybersecurity agency of Singapore. And I'm very sure 35 reported ransomware cases is more than that. All right, it's definitely more than 35. Next. Phishing, okay, that's about reported of 47,500 cases of uh, uh, phishing, all right, in the context of technology type of teams related to phishing email, banking and financial services, I'm not surprised to be honest because cyber attackers out there are going after your money, that's for sure. And the third in, in number in rank is about email service provider. This is where hackers trying to uh, pretend they are coming from one of your trusted service provider. All right, crafting email, pretending like it's from a real one, but actually it's not. Okay, next, website defacement. Okay, so basically if you have an online website, all right, doing online learning, okay, it's available 24 by 7, hackers will go there and do defacement and bring down your websites. Okay, and the next morning when you launch your website, abc.com, it's been defaced. It has been replaced by something else. All right, and asking you for a fee to restore, all right? Now, uh, these screenshots um, is an extract of the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore, Cy uh, Singapore Cyber Landscape 2019 report. The link is there, feel free to download free distribution, all right? Next, having a cybersecurity strategy, more focus and less noise is very important. Now, as business owner move towards digitalization, all right? Businesses, business owners, CEO, CTO, CIOs has to think about security first. All right? Have a good cybersecurity strategy sitting side by side with your business strategy and objectives. All right? And give business owners an example. All right? If you are running an online, or rather, if you are running a business that is tuition center, all right? but because of this COVID situation, your new business strategy is to move your tuition center in a very classroom base to online base. That's your new business strategy. Okay, what is your cybersecurity strategy about? All right. So in this context, build a cybersecurity program strategy that is to protect your online portal. 
right? Um, your online portal is going to be accessible for your students, for your tutors, your teachers, your employees, or even your partners. It's going to be there 24 by 7, and it's going to be a critical asset, right? And your cybersecurity strategy is to ensure it's there 24 by 7, free from cyber attacks, right? Four points I want to highlight and quickly, you know, run through with all audience here is that network security, right? As digitalizations happen um, at a rapid pace, typical firewall parameter defense will be still required, right? And having a zero trust is very important moving forward. Trust no devices, all right? Even inside the threat is a concern. Point two, user and endpoint protection. More and more employees, more and more business owners, enterprises are moving towards bring your own device, right? Mm -hmm. And working from home, as we all know, right? So having that zero trust for your personal device with your company data is important. How do you protect that? And your email is sitting on it. Your company data is sitting on your personal device. How do you work around this? Threat intelligence. Um, I, I, I echo what um, Jonas has talked about in terms of the threat intelligence, the importance of threat intelligence. When cyber attack happens, you need that threat intelligence and database to correlate between malware and information about it and correlation, right? Um, we work very closely with uh, Fortinet in establishing a very good threat intelligence platform, right? Um, the end result of all this is security analytics dashboard where we collate all of the data into information and easy to understand dashboard for business owner, C-suites. That's important to bring it down and escalate up to the management to have that overall visibility. Next, I'll talk about in terms of the how, right? Why outsourcing of cybersecurity makes sense for your businesses? Uh, four high level points, dependable technical support. Now, focus on the business strategy but at the same time, having that cybersecurity strategy in place to provide 24 by 7 type of civilians, monitoring in place, right? So you need that, right? It's not when cybersecurity is a if, right? It's when it's going to happen, right? So you need that technical support. Cost reduction. Now, we all know that cybersecurity resources, manpower, or even investing in security controls is going to be high. Right. I spoke to one of the CEO uh, recently and he mentioned to me, and it's, it's a very good question. Business owners uh, and that CEO asked me, David, for every dollar that I invest in one of the security controls, what's my ROI? Right? I've been spending so much on cybersecurity solutions, but what's my ROI? Right? The answer to this is that if you are able to outsource your cybersecurity out to a trusted advisor, right, the first immediate ROI you will be able to see is that cost reduction, all right? And you are able to predict this into easy to understand operational expenses and budget moving forward. Additionally, it gives you the extra layer of protection, all right? Because you have the expertise 24 by seven to look after your business. The outcome of this is that it's going to have added business value, really focusing about how to expand your business, scale up business, leave cybersecurity out to the experts, right? So what is managed security service provider? All right, in short, we call that the MSSP, right? So basically MSSP in short is a third party uh, vendor that manage and implement network security controls and continuously monitoring your internal and your external environment in terms of cyber threats, right? So most of the MSSP out there provide a wide range of services. You can see from point A to F. Right, these are very high level. Of course, it provides more than that. It also does a lot of advisories. Right, Jonas brought up a point about uh, ransomware attack. Right, about cyber threats. Many businesses out there have no expertise in that. Right, so have this MSSP to be that trusted advisor. Right, to provide that expertise to walk through with you in terms of your digital journey. Um. I reiterate the point, um, having MSSP lower the cost, whether it's from a staff cost, investment standpoint, and you have no unexpected cost, right? Everything will be part of your budget. Point two, focus, right? Free up your time, move your business forward, think about how to scale up, 
right, and have cyber security to scale along with your businesses. That leads to expertise. Now, uh, a lot of cyber security folks out there, right, we all know they are in demand. But where are the good ones? The good ones, they are all with the MSSP to provide that uh, visibility to business, uh, whether you can be in the tuition center um, business that I talked about, it can be other business verticals, right? Having cybersecurity experts in different business verticals through MSSP will give you that in-depth visibility. Point four, 24 by seven monitoring, right? So when monitoring comes in place, alerts becomes a norm. Five, scalability, all right? If the business starts to scale up, all right? Have cybersecurity to grow with you, walk through with you. Now I'll touch about one of a business case, all right? Managed DDoS protection service. So before I go into the details of uh, managed DDoS protection service, so what is a DDoS, all right? Going back to the business example of online e-learning portal, when a DDoS happened by cyber attackers or attackers out there that wants to bring your website down, the overall intent of that DDoS is to create denial of service, right? Attackers start to attack your online e-learning portal so that you are not able to log in to your online portal, whether you are business owners, students, teachers, or even vendors, right? So organization concern is that DDoS has been increased in attack size, right? We talk about IoT, right? Jonas talked about the increase in attacks for IoT, right? So that is one area that business will be concerned, especially given that 5G is going, uh, is going to scale up. So IoT attacks has a very close relationship with DDoS attack. Service availability. When DDoS happen, it brings down your website and it affects your customer. And in the event that DDoS happen, what is worse still, you are unable to recover. Okay? Attacks has become more complex. Right? It's not just about creating DDoS. Right. Very often we know from an attack standpoint, DDoS can be a decoy. Right. So while attackers are doing DDoS attack to your website, on the back end, they are trying to hack your database, hack your personal data, hack your customer data. Okay. And also uh, many business uh, owners out there, right, there is a lot of regulation compliance in place, whether you are a CII right, or whether you are following certain uh, framework within your company. Right. So, there is an increase in regulation requirement. So I, go, I will touch base about the how, right? We talk about many aspects of cyber attacks. So having a managed security service is important, MSSP in short, but what separates the good from the great, right? Many business out there uh, will have always a question. David, MSSP, there's so many choices out there. What's the differentiator? The good versus the are great. Right, so three key points: proactive monitoring and advisory. Right, so the, the the good vendors out there will provide report detailing the type of attack. But the great vendors or great MSSP partner out there is able to create that response when the attack comes in swiftly and also to mitigate that DDoS attack. A good vendor that provide flexible service package will provide very narrow range of service, very fixed package. But the great one will, will be able to provide a pay-as-you-use model so that you have different options available. I think at the end of the day, as business owners, you want to have that flexibility. Okay, the last part, intelligence customer portal, right? Typically, MSSP out there provide MSSP reports, uh, customer portals, but with very static options. Now, the great one will be the one that provides on-demand service activation and real-time protection coverage whenever attack comes in and whenever your business is ready to scale up, right? Okay, we talk about 24 by 7 monitoring, okay? But business owners always ask me a question. How does a 24 by 7 uh, operation or uh, monitoring center looks like, right? In SPTEL, we call that the integrated operation center. Right. To, to, to business owner out there, in layman term, is 24 by 7 monitoring. It is an environment where uh, cybersecurity experts are there to provide 24 by 7 surveillance and that alert. 
it's very process based it's very structured based so if you look at the flow chart everything is structured there's no surprises even there is surprises in place there will be a process to handle it on the right hand side is um you can see my colleagues fellow colleagues from the operation center providing that monitoring and uh, response for all our customers now my key takeaways um i just really want to highlight uh, three key points the first point is align your security strategy with your business goals you know i talked about um, the example about uh, moving tuition center from a very classroom based to online based right have the cyber security to walk this journey with the business right be part of that journey right design and build a cyber security program now uh, some of the uh, secret in the ingredients for a successful cyber security program right is incident response right um, security awareness this is important right cyber security is not a single function alone right we got to work with different business vertical diff different business function and form that as a part of a program last but not least engage a trusted advisor to be part of our digitalization journey in this uh, in this context the mssp um, i hope that sptel can be that trusted partner and advisor to walk through with businesses as part of your digitalization right whether is it going to be 5g uh, iot or even managed services uh, we want to be that trusted advisor so if you like, would like to connect with us uh, talk to us at inquiry at sptel.com uh, give us an opportunity we hope to have some dialogue with you so with that, uh, thank you very much, uh, audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, thank you so much for the insightful sharing, uh, especially on the managed service part for security. Uh, we would like to invite all the speakers back uh, for the Q&A session. But before that, we have a last poll coming up. Uh, so do take us, uh, give us uh, another 40 seconds, right? While we, while we actually uh, go through this poll, as a business owner, what is your most critical cybersecurity issue right now? So, uh, greatly appreciate if you can actually just take uh, about 30 seconds of your time just to participate in this poll. Yeah. Because I can see that uh, when it comes to the Q&A session, right, there's a lot of questions actually on security side as well. So, it uh, would be great if we, uh, everybody can participate, right, uh, just to share your comments and feedback. Okay, I think we're all good. Uh, let's end the poll and probably just kickstart the uh, Q&A session. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, I always like being the... Uh, thanks, SPTEL, for actually inviting me to be the uh, moderator for this session, uh, for the Q&A. So I always like to be the uh, Q&A moderator because I get to shoot the first few questions. Yeah. So uh, I would like to ask the uh, first, two que uh, first question to uh, Kang Ni and Valerie. Uh, the question is, for SMEs who are actually feeling constrained, right, by limited resources, uh, what are the areas that they uh, that you think businesses should actually invest in to get the best bang for their buck, especially in uh, this current crisis that we have, right, for COVID nineteen? Uh, over the uh, over to Kang and Valerie, please. Right, um, maybe I'll take the take the question first. Um, so I was actually referring to the the response coming from the poll as well. Um, there's a good 50% that is already in the process of digital transformation. Kami, but, would you like me to share the poll results? Um, yeah, yeah, the, the one on the digital transformation, I guess. Sure, let me just share it. Yeah. yeah, so actually from the poll results, we can see, you know, there's about 43% already in the process of digital transformation, but also open, you know, to explore more. Uh, on the available platforms and resources. So just now you mentioned about, you know, uh, constraints, uh, so uh, limited resources, right? So, so maybe from the budget um, perspective, um, if SMEs can look at lowering um, the total cost of ownership, uh, for example, like embarking on a software-defined network, right, where you'll be able to turn on services on demand and also scale up the bandwidth as and when you need it, um, this will actually reduce, you know, the, the wasted capacity. And of course, for, for manpower constraints, um, definitely if you look at IoT deployments, uh, it will definitely help 
um, because you, you are relying then on, on sensors uh, to help you to capture the data. And deployment is also not uh, investment heavy with uh, SBTAL. And that is where I also talk about you know, the um, ecosystem that we have and also this one-stop platform that we have as well to string up the vendors and also the um, solution providers and end users um, so that we can you know, um, go to market together uh, in a more cost-efficient way. Right, so I think um, there are ways uh, out there, uh, and you know we welcome SMEs to come to us, you know, for advice on the digitalization and also for IoT deployments. Yeah. Thank you, Kangi. Uh, Valerie, your thoughts? Right. So as an SME owner, I think we will use the Moscow model. Like um, we have to identify what we must have, what we should have, what we could have, and what we want. To identify the potential areas within the company itself on how to improve and what to improve. For example, work process automation, reducing the manual repetitive work. So we have to focus on area that has the most impact on our daily operations. And most importantly, as SME owners or bosses, I think you need to identify this area before engaging your consultant to assist you. And Definitely getting the right IT partners like SPTEL to assist in digitalization and integration of the, the project itself. So recently we have a smart uh, container project and we can see clearly that when the boss actually know what they want to do, it's a lot easier for us to um, you know, work together and then make the project a successful one. So in, in short, like we as, as SME owners, when we are starting the journey together, we do not go for big things and we must understand that all small changes will have a big impact. Yeah. Uh, just a follow-up question uh, to Valerie again. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we can see that in your whole transformation journey, right? You seem to be, wow, as, as, you, as you grow each year, you seem to be incorporating a lot more technology and everything. So how do you actually shift the mindset of your staff to keep up with all these digitalization efforts? Especially uh, you're in a traditional uh, and HO industry. So uh, probably can you just share a bit? Yeah. Mm, I think the challenges is really huge. But first of all, we need to look into probably the root cause of the, the challenges behind. Why are the staff actually fearful of um, the whole situation? Are they afraid because of the IT system? Are they afraid because of the job security after automation? Mm. So with that, we need to address their fear and then explain clearly the reason for digitalization. And then uh, the most important thing is what is their role after the digitalization effort. So changing the mindset is very important because they need to see um, digitalization and digital transformation as a form of tool for them to use and not to replace them. So like what um, we have been talking about, Thereafter, we will have to send them to reskill and then they can be uh, relevant in our industry. So, for example, one of uh, my, my staff, she was doing the manual task of like um, Excel, um, updating work orders using Excel, and it spent a lot of time on that. However, when we did the ERP system in our company, we are able to evolve her admin role into something more uh, technology. So, today she is uh, happier and then uh, spending less effort of the manual task. Yeah. Right. That's great. Okay. So uh, right now, uh, thanks Kang Lee and uh, Valerie for answering those two questions. Uh, so now I will actually touch on the security bit. So uh, for, for Jonas and David, right? So let's say if I'm actually just starting out on cyber security, what are the two or three things that I should actually focus on first? Uh, Jonas, you want to take out the question first? Yes, sure. So in my opinion, it always starts with the people. If we can have the best security in place, if the people are not aware why we're doing this, we have a big issue. And the problem with security is a lot of people think about it's being a, it, it blocks something, it delays certain things. But when you purchase security, it's not like you have a new monitor on your screen, on, on your wall, and, and you can use it in for, for for additional things. It's, it's for a lot of people in their head, it's like, okay, I, I have to buy it, but I don't really want to. And usually they uh, try to avoid it until they get hacked. And then like, oh, my business is not running anymore. And now they feel like pressure to do it, but that's obviously too late. So in my opinion, first thing is awareness, especially 
everyone works with emails these days. And if people are not aware that you should not open things which you're not sure what it's about, like attachments, like links, it will be very challenging afterwards. And you need very good protections in place as well. But awareness is, is very important. But then, of course, once people are aware about it, you also need certain security layers in there. And unfortunately, it's not like you can say, I just buy this one thing and I'm good and I'm over. It's, it's like a castle. You have like a, a bridge, you have like the, the water around, you have so many different doors. But if one single door in your castle is open, you have a big risk that someone is able to move in. And once he's inside your company, he can then spend some time and move laterally through your network. So it's, um, it's a lot about having a proper platform. And obviously, you need to have people with the right skill set. So if you are not able to do this by yourself, that's completely fine. Don't be embarrassed to ask people who do specialize on this on a daily basis, like SPTEL, for example. That is, is, is your main, um, you know exactly what's going on out there and you can use what you learned in other places to implement on, on, with other customers. So it's, it's very important that we work together in this kind of environment. Well, it's just a lot of that before uh, David carry on to give his part, right? Actually, uh, how much does, uh, what's the ballpark figure for hiring a cybersecurity uh, expert to just sit in the SMB office actually? Probably can just share a bit, although I think it can be a bit sensitive, like uh, what's the ballpark cost? Yeah. Then, uh, then does it really make sense for, for, for such an expert to actually sit in one organization actually? Honestly, I'm, I'm more for a research department, so I'm, I was never really engaged in, in consulting. And, and, but it, it's, it gets quite expensive very quickly and often just having someone on site is, is not maybe what you're looking for. You have, to, uh, you have to have a strategy about where are you now? Where do you see your business going? How do we implement security into this? And having partners who specialize on these kind of events can make a big difference in the end, for sure. Okay. Uh, David? I, I add on, I think um, SMEs can look at uh, SME centers, like Ashtabasa mm. SME centers, mm. or even the digital tech hub, you know, mm. for cybersecurity advice. And, you know, these are uh, government agencies who I think, um, you know, they can point to the right, uh, correct um, direction. But of course, for us, I think uh, we have the experts here as well. Mm. Right? So I think there are, there are quite a lot of, uh, you know, um, resources out there mm. yeah, for SMEs to, to look into. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. mm. David, regarding the questions uh, about the two, three things that you think that uh, uh, SMB should actually focus in, uh, when we actually start out on uh, cyber security? Yeah, so um, I, think I, I, I think I'll echo what um, Jonas has mentioned. It's all about uh, people and the awareness. Um, but even we, before we reach out to people, have the plan in place. You know, I go back to my presentation where we talk about cybersecurity program being a very close relationship with the whole business strategy. Right? Um, many a times, people view cybersecurity like the policeman with a baton running around. Right? Mm -hmm. So very often in the office, we are not the most popular people. Okay? But I think that mindset may have to change. Right? Treat us as a trusted business partners. All right? And hopefully, you know, uh, more businesses are ready to open up to have that space for cybersecurity personnel that is also very good in the business context to sit in a room and talk about businesses, you know, not just cybersecurity. You know, walk through this journey together. Personally, I went through a couple of uh, digital journey with uh, different size of businesses. So I think uh, one of the uh, issue is always been the receptive level, right? And waiting for things to happen. Jonas, you know, rightly brought, brought that up. So don't wait for things to happen, you know. Start early having that trusted advisor, that partner, the MSSP to start the digital, digital journey and transformation. That journey is not easy, but it's going to be very exciting. Thanks, thanks, David. Okay, uh, thanks for answering my question. So I think there's a lot of Q&A questions coming in. Uh, let's uh, delve deep into them now. So I think this question, I think I can actually address it to uh, Valerie. So uh, we have this question coming in saying that uh, when we do digitization or business transformation, right, more from an end user uh, perspective, what is the uh, investment or cost ratio for digital security? Should we allocate, let's say, 50% to enhance on the security and safety training on the staff. Yeah, correct. Because you have actually, uh, Valerie, for yourself, you have actually implemented a lot of technology, right? So I think uh, this one may be good for to seek your advice, basically. 
So initially, when we started off the digital transformation, um, security probably is not the, the main priority as of then. However, as we move on to um, getting IoT implemented and collecting data of our customers' data and stuff like that, we, we will have to look into this area. Yeah, so probably um, as the, the going forward, there'll be more budget being cut in, in terms of like our security. Now let's take a look at the next question uh, over here. Uh, there's, a, there's a question coming in say, my employees are actually working from home right now. I'm actually worried that when they are linking from their home Wi-Fi, there will be a security risk. Am I over worried or what should I do to ensure that nothing bad will happen? Uh, David or Jonas, uh, which one of you would like to take the question? I can, I can start and maybe David, uh, if you want to add something, just uh, feel free to interrupt sure. me at any point. So I think the, the worry is, is, is legit for sure. Um, people working from home, it's a completely different environment. If you have your corporate office and you have security layers in place and people start to connecting from outside, it might be a problem because at home, you don't know what's going on there. Maybe you have other people in the family. Maybe you lose private laptops and stuff like this. So I highly recommend having a secure access to your network with VPNs, for example, which can be configured on your device itself and also do some vulnerability testing simultaneously. So it understands is the device you're connecting from towards your data in your company, is, are both parties secure? And if, if this is given, then uh, things will be turn out much better than, of course, than just pray and hope nothing happens is usually not the, the, the best approach to do when it comes to security. Yeah. Okay. David? Um, so I think a very important part is uh, start off with the awareness, you know, uh, have the awareness conducted online to all your employees, you know, um, and I share a very classic case, you know, um, one of the questions very often being asked is, David, I'm using a shared laptop, right? My 12 year old son, my husband and I, we are sharing their laptop and I'm using that to assess my company resources. What do I do? You know, these are very, very common questions, right? So very often our answer is that, uh, have your shared laptop um, updates, install all your Microsoft update, have antivirus, all right? Microsoft provide free antivirus, so use it, right? And also at the company level, at the enterprise level, implement 2FA, right? So if you are assessing your email, have that 2FA in place, right? And in layman shop, have a defense in that strategy, and that forms part of your whole cybersecurity program, right? Okay, thank you. So we have another two questions, right? Uh, one is actually directed uh, to Jonas from Ronnie. So he said, uh, good morning, Jonas. Uh, can you advise how we can confirm and check the software being developed is actually secured? So uh, how can we add additional security after receiving the software from a developer whom they have probably outsourced to actually do the work? Uh, do you have any advice for them? Uh, yes, so in the end, every software has some issues sometimes. So what happens is vendor realize, hey, we have a security leak in here and we provide a patch. And the main issue which I see out there is that there is a patch available, but people are not patching it. And if you don't patch, you are risking being attacked by something which everyone knows about because the vendor explicitly is telling, hey, there's a vulnerability out there. For example, next time you take your phone and you install uh, an app, you, you do an update with an application which is on your phone, any, any application, try to, um, try to read the release notes. And very often you see in there security update, security update, security update. And this is because the vendor knows there's a vulnerability, so I provide an update. And there's a lot of software out there, and I've seen this from uh, SPTEL as well, who, where you do vulnerability checks, because you, you use software to understand hey, this software is out of date, so it's a very high priority to update it. But um, overall, there, whatever is software um, will have some updates and issues sometimes, so it's important to keep those up to date as fast as possible. David, you got anything to add on for that? No, I'm good, yeah. Okay, okay. so uh, we'll move on. There's a question actually directed at uh, Valerie. So I think uh, you got somebody interested in the uh, temperature taking solution. So uh, for this question is saying that uh, for the temperature taking solution, 
sets you mentioned that is actually integrated with uh, safe entry. So you mean that we can get the data from safe entry directly without the need to collect our own visitor data? Uh, yeah, probably can give some feedback. Okay, so this sets device that we have is um, by, um, it's like a binary. When we talk about uh, somebody walk into the uh, maybe a premise, the temperature will be taken automatically when you put your forehead towards the device. Mm. And if you have no um, fever, you will be able to see a button being popped up on your phone. And by pressing it, you go direct to the safe entry portal and then you just submit. So there's only one QR code at the end of the day, which is the initial part, which is go into our back end. And you will be able to go direct into the safe entry. However, the data from safe entry is not able to be shared a full bus because it becomes it belongs to the um, government and they are not allowed to share. But we have our own uh, dashboard and database behind where we can release to you at the end of every day on who has uh, came over to the premise uh, and who has temperature being taken and what is uh, whether they have fever or they are healthy. So, uh, regarding the data that's being downloaded, uh, does it also uh, take down the uh, NRIC actually? Yeah, so there is uh, this prompt that allows the visitor to just write down their name and the IC number or contact number. And when they visit the second time, they do not have to uh, redo this anymore. It will be saved in the database. I see. Okay. Okay. So, uh, right now, I think we'll move on to our last question over here. So, uh, I think... This is a pretty good question that I think is actually mostly on everybody's mind as well. So I think uh, okay, it's a question from Roy. He's actually asking, does moving to cloud provided by a reputable provider uh, actually increase the data security uh, compared to having an in-house server? Yeah. So um, we have the user, we have the service provider and experts. Probably you can give your final view on this. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll start off first. Yep. Um, yeah, so it's comparison, right? Housing it inside one of the storeroom or one of the room, one of the meeting room for all your company data or, or services, this service hosting on the cloud. So I think one of the advice um, to all business owners, um, audience out there is that if you're thinking to move as part of your digital transformation, you're going to move to the cloud, right? Look at how providers with credentials. All right, certifications, right, and have that buy into the contract in SLA. All right, contractual means is one of the way to work with cloud service provider because you don't know where they are, right? Your data is flying around. Okay, so have that um, and be in part of your contracts, right? Reputable one with the right certification, right? That will actually bring down the risk. Uh, Valerie, any, any thoughts from yourself? Uh, have you actually, uh, what's, what's the kind of uh, allocation you are, you are you're at currently within uh, your organization in terms of in-house in server and uh, cloud, cloud hosted uh, infrastructure? Um, for us, we, for our internal operations, we use our in-house server because mm. we can have a full control of it. However, okay. if you talk about like um, uh, assisting client, then we will be uh, interested to uh, work on external and then as well as collaboration with SPTAL if they have any uh, solution that is uh, that can complement this. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, Jonas, any thoughts on this topic? Uh, yes, I think David summarized it pretty well. Uh, what I would like to add though is that a cloud is in the end just someone else's computer. It's also a device which runs on the internet and it's here again important to keep in mind if you decide to go to any cloud providers, is it, uh, is it uh, Alibaba, is it uh, Amazon, Microsoft, whatever, or doesn't matter, smaller ones, bigger ones, in the end, they have security features, but again, you need to know what you do. Usually they provide an infrastructure and you can use it, but you need to know what are you doing, what kind of impact it has, and how to properly secure it. It's still your job to secure it, even if it's in the cloud. I think, I think because uh, there's always this general thought that uh, when I select a so-called reputable service provider, I subscribe everything, then the responsibility always lies on the uh, service provider's hands. But in a lot of times, if we actually look into the agreement, right, it's just providing you with the infrastructure. Uh, so basically when it comes to the configuration side, 
if you actually misconfigure, right, it's actually still the user which need to bear the responsibility, right? So I, I think in, in a certain way, it's like you need to select a, 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 a good service provider who knows what they're doing to actually configure everything properly for you. Because if not, you're, you're, you're doing everything by yourself and you don't know how to do it well, then I think uh, even though the parameter may be secured by the reputable service provider, but the internal gaps that is actually due to misconfiguration will still open holes uh, within within your own uh, uh, system for, for hacking, basically. Yeah. So uh, any thoughts on that, David, from the managed service provider piece? Because I think for the SMEs, right, they are always looking for site. Hey, can I just dedicate this whole thing out? Because this is not my core business. I'm actually that means you know for any business like that, I'm I'm actually going out to do things. IT is just one of the enablers. Is there any way that I can just leave it to someone? And uh, what's the score of works that's covered by the MSP, right? They can just let me be conf uh, confident enough to say that I can just leave it to you guys. Anything, uh, you guys will just uh, prompt me and act act on it to resolve the issues. Probably you can just uh share share an example or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, one of the example is that when mm. MSSP starts to engage customer, it's always that dialogue. You know, mm. the final stage is always about uh, monitoring and alert. But the very front part is to have that business dialogue with business owners, you know, of course at the right time to find out what are the services and data that is going over to the cloud. Or is it going to be in-house? Like what Valerie has mentioned in the aspect mm. of that business that uh, she's trying to set up. You know, if once that has been determined, have that conversation with the MSSP and the MSSP role right now is as a start, provide an advisory, you know, understand the environment, then onboard the customers and provide the monitoring. So it's end to end. So very much uh, business owners will think that, okay, I'll pass it to MSSP is done. But I think it's a shared responsibility to have that business dialogue, yeah, to understand the critical assets. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. So uh, before I end, right, I think on the note, because we are talking about a very sophisticated stuff over here. So I think uh, we, we covered the topic from HP, HP yesterday who mentioned about hardware, having AI coming in to drive certain like uh, diagnosis and hardware and everything all through AI. So I think internally over here uh, with the SD-WAN, right, uh, software defined thing, we are also having some kind of intelligence to uh, update people and stuff. So Jonas, for your site, I think the key question now is, do you see hackers using AI also to do cybersecurity breaches? Because I think this is something that's going to be very scary if AI has also permeated to that level. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, there I have some bad news for you, Chris. They do. They do. And it, it's an, if it's also important to understand that different kind of attack. So first of all, obviously they can use a lot of data to find new vulnerabilities and then use these kind of vulnerabilities to get in. But they're also using, some of you might have heard about deep fakes. So recording a lot of voice from a certain person, for example, from a podcast or a political person, and you have a lot of voice recording and you are able to have machines saying what you want in their voice. So you might get people to inf influence with something which never happened and doing phone calls or, or video script. So, it's something, it's definitely something on the horizon and it's, it's similar as it has always been in security with good guys and bad guys. It's, it's, a, it's a race between them and cat and mouse game. So whatever they use, we use as well. And that's sometimes a bit unfortunate about security. It's like a, cut, a double uh, cutting out in sword. So whatever you can use for the good guys, you can use for the bad guys. And that's why it's very important to keep up to date. So oh, uh, thanks, thanks for the, the final sharing. So I think uh, we have reached the end of the session. So I think uh, back to the team, right, which is uh, preparing for the digital future through business transformation. Uh, I would probably just like to invite each of the speakers just to give their final uh, parting thoughts before we end today's session. Uh, Kang Yi, you want to go first? All right. So um, for digitalization, I think the very key thing is to start right um, for SMEs to really just uh, say I want to look into this right now instead of you know keep researching or keep asking people what they are doing I mean this is what we usually see and also I mean from from the sharing that I did uh, for example Lift Hub they have been around for 30 over years mm -hmm. right and they realize that you know if they don't start to go into digitalization or explore other ways uh, of their business, um, like looking into IoT, they will not be able to come in for uh, bigger jobs, 
right? And in fact, we're even talking about like uh, the evolution or internet of elevators as what they shared with me. So I think this is something that, um, you know, is, is not a choice anymore for digitalization. Um, but I think for the, in the entire context in Singapore, there's ample support and also um, experts uh, to help SMEs in this area. But I guess uh, the, the main thing is really to, to start doing it. And of course, not all SMEs, uh, they are well trained in, in this. And therefore, you know, there's help like uh, from the associations, right? Uh, SME centers. Um, and we work together with you guys, for example. And you can point us as well to the end users who are looking at digitalization. So I think uh, we are here. And for all the audience, I think uh, it's not uh, something that uh, uh, you have you are afraid to step into all right um, I think the the main thing is really to just start looking into it right and also to plan in uh, cyber security right from the start from day one not when you know you are being attacked so I think that should be part of the digitalization journey right and it helps because it's not one of the responses that from the poll that we get was uh, one of the deciding factor was the government grant and SPTEL did secure some grants for uh, for, for such projects basically yes yep. Okay, uh, Valerie, your final thoughts? I think as business owner, we need to embrace the change. A lot of time it's our mindset that hinder us from taking the first step. So once you know that today we already know that from the session, the benefits that we will reap from digitalization, it is time you change your mindset and then be brave and take the first step. Yeah. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. Uh, Jonas, over to you. Don't put on your black hat. Don't put on your white hat. Yeah. Uh, it, it has to be a top-down approach. It has to be assigned by the, by the top-level managers uh, what kind of goals you want to achieve during the digital transformation and having their support during all the procedures and processes to achieve, in the end, your expected outcomes. Okay. Uh, David, our last speaker. Yeah, so I think um, if you ask cybersecurity guy, they will tell you everything about cybersecurity, right? So 10 years, 15 years ago, cybersecurity is non-existence, right? But right now, as part of the digital transformation, there's a lot of emphasis. Mm -hmm. So I think if there's one point I want to wrap up is that, um, and I echo along with all the speakers, is that start early, you know, have that um, identification of stakeholders early, have them on board quickly and open the dialogue. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's, that's important. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, once again, a big thank you to Kang Ni, Valerie, Jonas, as well as David for your insightful analysis and uh, valuable sharing. We hope that everyone has been inspired and actually gained new knowledge for the new future over here. So before we end the session, a quick announcement that SGPCI is actually offering a special discount for our new member signups before 21st of September this year. The promotion details are actually on the screen right now. So do give us a call or drop us an email if you're interested. Also, uh, please let us know your comments on SME ICC Live through the feedback survey. You can scan the QR code on screen or follow the redirect uh, link after you have closed this session. Your, your feedback is actually valuable to us so that we can actually improve your experience for the next event. We have more exciting tracks coming up uh, for you. Please do join us for the upcoming tracks in the afternoon or scan the QR code to view the full program. Thank you so much and uh, have a good lunch ahead. Uh, look forward to seeing you back this afternoon. Thank you.